Hey guys, it's Sean from Crafted Elements. Today's video is going to be a full build on going from raw live edge wood to a finished epoxy resin and wood shakuri board just like this. Um, this is going to be a fairly long one because we go over all elements of the build, so uh, get ready for a good ride. Anyway, we are going to be using this very cool piece of ambrosia maple or uh, wormy maple, and essentially we're going to be using one of our cool shakuri board silicone molds. So if you're watching any of my other videos, you know, we probably, you probably know that we do sell these on our website at boardmolds.com or craftedelements.com and then click on the mold section at the top. But essentially we use these and we build these and we sell these to makers just like yourselves um, because they're awesome. Uh, but no, seriously, they're better than the wooden tuck tape method, uh, which I've demonstrated in another video. That's a typically a wooden tuck tape mold that you have to build yourself. Um, there's also things that make HDP molds, which are also pretty good. Um, they're just not flexible um, and they still require work to unscrew, screw, reseal, etc. Uh, which is why we prefer to use the silicone molds. Anyway, this video is going to start with cutting these pieces, preparing these pieces, putting them in the mold, talking about the different types of resin to use, and um, once it's set in a couple of days, we can plane it, sand it, oil it, and be done. You can see the finished product. Let's get started. All right, so we have uh, a nice thick piece of ambrosia maple here. And I really like this part of the, the slab. So I'm actually gonna use this part to make our scrutie board. So our mold is 24 inches by 12 by one and a half. So we can, <clears throat> we can actually technically just cut this and put it in. I'm gonna plane this first just because it is a little bit thicker than the, the height of the mold. Um, but again, we're gonna figure out which pieces we want to actually make our, um, our board out of. So the first thing we're gonna do is cut 24 inches this way. This way. We're gonna cut this in half, probably take a little bit off, inverse the pieces to create the river effect and lay it in the mold to see what it looks like. All right, once we've got our wood prepped and cut, we can simply drop it in this mold. And this is how easy it is. Watch, wait for it. There you go. It's ready. This mold didn't need any prep. Just drop it in and go. So the next thing we're gonna need to do is calculate how much epoxy resin we need. Um, and to do that, it's a fairly simple equation. It's cubic inches divided by 1.8 and that will give you the amount of ounces of resin you'll need. You can then convert ounces to milliliters or gallons or whatever. Um, so in this case, we've got our 24 inch mold, so it's 24 inches in the center. Uh, you've got an inch and a half of depth. And then the trick uh, of doing this, it's a little tricky with this board because there's such a wide section here and skinny here, but you wanna have the average um, width, okay? So I mean, you know, here we've got two, we've got two, we've got three and a half. All the way over here, we've got five and a half. So conservatively, we can say the average width of this channel here is three inches. So it's 24 by three inches, average width by 1.5 inch height. Um, that gives you roughly 108. And then you'll divide that by 1.8 to get 60 ounces. So we need 60 ounces of resin, or roughly 1800 milliliters, roughly half a gallon. Um, now choosing the resin. I, I did another video on this in the YouTube channel, uh, but if you didn't see it, here's the gist of it. 
you want to make sure you have a casting resin and you also want to make sure you have a casting resin that will support this depth of casting. This is an inch and a half. A lot of casting resins will only do up to an inch and it really has to do with the volume and heat generated. When you pour a lot of resin um, volume wise uh, into a mold and the exothermic reaction starts to occur, it gets you, you end up generating heat. And if it's too hot and it gets too hot too quickly, you end up just bubbling up and curling and it's, it's, it's gross. It'll destroy, your, uh, it'll destroy your project. So for example, something like this, this tabletop art resin, this is not what you use for this. This is not for casting. This is for thin layers of, um, thin layers uh, on top of a piece of wood. They can also be used to make resin art like this. So you've got a piece of wood here and you've got just a thin layer of resin. That's what this stuff is for. You want to use casting resin. So a couple of big brands, uh, Total Boat, um, Eco Poxy makes a good product. Um, there's a lot of different casting, Ma Maze Poxies, MAS Poxies makes um, a good product. There's a lot of different products out there. We're in Canada and Rusty Design uh, out in Brampton, I believe, Ontario, uh, has a product they import from China. It's fairly inexpensive, but it's pretty good. Um, and it's, this is a slow cast. So this stuff is actually made for like a two inch pour, which is what we would be close to doing here. So here's a slow uh, setting resin. Uh, what that's gonna do is effectively, it's gonna heat up, but not as much as something like the art resin uh, in a thicker volume would. Um, and it's gonna take two, maybe even three days to set. So it's gonna take a really long time to set, but it's not gonna generate the amount of heat that would effectively ruin the piece and bubble up everything. So typically when you're doing like a big project, like a river table, you end up with like a slow pour, slow curing resin like this. Anyway, let's get started here mixing our resin. We actually uh, calculated out based on this volume, we need 60 ounces. So we're not gonna need just one, we're gonna need two of these cups. These are super handy, I bought these from Amazon. Uh, ARP mix, painting mix cup, they're 1100 milliliters, about 40 ounces. So an AB mix uh, epoxy resin, uh, this particular one is three parts A with one part B. So you can do, I know some people say do B first, do A first. I'm not really sure what the best option is. Um, I think the key is as long as you are consistent. So I'm gonna pop these open. I'm gonna get my gloves on. And we're gonna end up with 60 ounces. So basically I'm gonna mix 30 ounces uh, in each one. And because it's a three to one, we can go, I think, well, we can do the eight to 24. So we can do eight, uh, eight ounces of this per cup and then 24 ounces of this per cup. That will give us uh, our three to one ratio. Eight ounces there, eight ounces there. You definitely wanna make sure you wear gloves and to be honest, you probably have a, wet, a respirator on as well, um, especially if you're very sensitive to smell. Um, okay, so we're gonna go up to 32 ounces. All right, so we've got 32 ounces, because we did, because well, not 32 ounces of this, but 24 of this and eight of the part B, which gives us our three to one ratio. Then we're going to gently stir these. And I say gently because if you stir vigorously uh, with epoxy resin, you end up getting bubbles in this, um, which can then come out in your piece. Um, some people, will say, oh, you know, I say some people, if you're hardcore <laughs> and if you're building these professionally and doing a lot of them, you might want to invest in something called a degassing chamber or a vacuum chamber. What that effectively does is after you've mixed all your resin, you put it in this box, turn on the vacuum and it sucks all the air bubbles out of the resin. And that's going to really end up with, you're going to end up with the clearest resin 
I don't have one of those. I don't really see the need. I don't do a lot of these boards. Um, do mostly for demonstration of our molds. Um, I used to build a lot of boards, but that was uh, that was a couple of years ago when uh, when I was doing a lot of that stuff. And we built a lot of kid stuff, and we also import a lot of home products now. But aside, but besides the point, um, what I'm getting at is you can kind of do a, a good job if you uh, if you just mix this gently and then. Um, make sure you get all the bubbles out of the surface of your pour with a heat torch or a, um, a heat gun. All right. So now that we've decently did an initial mix of these, it's time for pigments. This is my fun bit of pig pigments here. Um, I got products in a little bit of everybody. I got uh, Black Diamond. Uh, you can get these on Amazon. They sell them in small packs as well as larger packs. Jacquard makes them. Um, so you've got the pearl pigments and then you've also got the, the alcohol-based pigments. So like pigments like this uh, wouldn't give you like that pearl effect. They'd be more of a solid color or an opaque color, but just a clear color. Um, most of the time when you're seeing, so for example, this is what you would get with like, a typical alcohol pigment. pigment. You'd get that kind of a, a clear, you know, I'm gonna say boring, but just a, a plain blue. Whereas when you're using the pearl pigments, you get the really cool kind of waves and swirls and that kind of stuff. And that's, I, to be honest, that's what most people like. Um, now in this case, because it's uh, maple that we're using, I'm actually gonna mix pigments. I'm gonna use um, the sky blue and carbon black. Uh, how much pigment to use, that's honestly up to you because it really, there's not really a rule for this because um, if you want to have like a, a, a very um, opaque board, then you use more pigment uh, so you get the less transparency. If you want just a little bit of pigment and you want to be able to see through the board, you use less pigment, less, less of this stuff. So it's a little bit of trial and error. Um, so in this case, I'm just going to actually use a third of a teaspoon of each color in each uh, batch and then we're gonna mix it. And then we're gonna end up effectively a dark blue because we we're mixing uh, a bright blue and a black. And I think that dark blue would look really, really nice with this with this uh, lighter maple. Put your mask on because these pigments are like, um, what would be the word? But they're, they're almost like flour on steroids. They just, if, if you get them in the air, they just kind of float everywhere. So you don't wanna be breathing that stuff in. too fast for this pigment will become airborne. Make sure you get around all the edges kind of doing this motion because <clears throat> if there's any hardener or B part or any um, pigment you want to make sure that it really gets mixed really well because the worst part is having a non-mixed section of this resin and it doesn't set correctly in your board and you've got kind of this like uh, goopy section in your board that didn't set. So you want to make sure this is really well mixed. And you know, if you don't like the color, you can change it. You can add more blue pigment if you wanted to lighten this up. I personally like this. I think this is awesome. Um, it's like a it's like a midnight blue, which is going to look really really cool um, with the uh, with a light maple. So again, we're going to keep mixing, keep mixing. I think the rule is typically three minutes of of decent mixing, and that'll give you uh, that'll give you proper proper mix. Just make sure that there's no pigment left. Obviously like you've got some pigment here so you want to make sure you get rid of all the pigment. Mix it in really really well. And then we can start on the fun part. So once these are really well mixed you can do your pouring. Now one thing I mentioned earlier with these silicone molds is that 
you know, you don't really have an easy mechanism for holding the wood down. Now, why do you want to hold the wood down? Well, when you put the resin in there, the resin is going to effectively, if you don't have anything on top, it's going to start lifting the wood. It's going to go under the wood and create almost like a floating piece of wood, which is something you don't want. So, I use these small um, weights, but, you know, that's even a little bit fancy. You could use uh, a brick or a rock. Um, you could use, you know, a piece of vinyl uh, or HDP and put that on top as well. So in case you get resin on there, it will come off as well. But I find these, uh, these work just fine. And that's sufficient enough weight to hold down the, uh, the wood. Well, here goes nothing. If you want to do this gently, don't do this crazy. Um, if you pour it thinner and pour it out like this, any unmixed parts of the resin are going to start mixing. And remember, we estimated the amount of resin based on that calculation. Uh, on this, it was really, really hard because there's such a wide section back here. So I may have too much resin, but we'll find out really soon. We might have just the perfect amount, we'll see. Resin's expensive, so you want to make sure you uh, get that all out of there. Um, you might be asking, because if you've watched other videos, you've watched other people do this. Why don't I um, pre-seal the edges of the wood first? So that's something that, that people do, especially when they're making tables. But here's the thing, guys. I've actually seen some tables made a few years ago using that method, like pre-sealing the edges, uh, come apart. So, I mean, as you know, wood expands and contracts, right? That's pretty obvious. Um, resin is super, super strong. But here's what happens. When you pre-seal the edges of the wood, you effectively create a thin layer of resin on the outside of the wood, um, which, which helps avoid the bubbles in doing this process. But then when you pour the huge volume of resin like this, it doesn't penetrate the wood at all. So you're effectively just bonding resin to resin and you're not ending up with an awesome connection from the resin to the wood, uh, just a small surface connection. So that's why I do it this way. Some people might argue with me, but I've seen tables come apart at the resin wood barrier, um, resin wood intersection rather, because the edges were pre-sealed. So it's kind of like a toss-up. Do you want to have to deal with bubbles and getting rid of more bubbles with your torch? Or do you want to deal with failure down the road? I think in the case of a charcuterie board, it probably doesn't matter. It's not mission critical. It's not super crazy expensive. You know, this board, once it's done, maybe it's going to be a couple hundred bucks, uh, you know, retail value if I wanted to sell it. It's not, uh, it's not like a $5,000 table where you're, you're going to be really hurting if you have to replace it. So up to you. Pre-seal the edges, don't pre-seal pre pre the, blah, pre-seal the edges. Um, but obviously pre-sealing the edges also really takes another day, right? Because you've got to apply the resin first, let it set, and then go. Okay, well, there we go. We have finished this. As you know, I mixed the resin a little bit. Um, what you're gonna find is over the next hour, you're gonna have bubbles coming out of here. And I'm gonna take a video of that as well to show you. But the way to get rid of those is quite simply with a torch. So you've got the torch with an end on it. Start this big bad boy up. And then just go over gently and you can maybe see on the camera, you start to see that sparkle. That's all these tiny little micro bubbles uh, bursting as they go over with the torch. So I've done that once now, but I think in 20 or 30 minutes, I'm gonna have to come back and do that again. This is probably not something you wanna just pour and then leave for the day. Uh, otherwise you're gonna have bubbles in your, in your resin. Um, now, a lot of people like that swirl effect, this, this kind of like, whew, you know, that, okay? But doing that right now, especially with a slow cure resin, is not gonna end, end up like this. If I did a time lapse on this video, you'd see this is effectively gonna be a universal one color thing if I left it for the next five or six hours, because effectively the heat's gonna, it's gonna heat up and it's just gonna start mixing and it's gonna be all like that. So what you actually need to do uh, in the case of a slow cure resin is come back in probably four or five hours, do your squiggles, you know, like this, if you wanted to actually be, have them set in the, in the resin to dry. If you've got a, a faster cure resin, like a one inch 
uh, thick pour resin. You could probably wait uh, maybe an hour, half an hour, an hour, and then do that and come back and like do this if you want to have the cool kind of lines and, and pearl effect in here. So as you can see, some time's been uh, gone by and the swirls are all gone just because of the reaction and the setting process. So this is where you come back, typically after a couple of hours, could be up to four or five hours if it's a slow curing epoxy. You don't have to do this. This is more like, I guess, visual or artistic preference. I think it just looks a little bit better with them, some texture in there versus the, you know, to bring out the pearl instead of just a plain color. And then again, you know, in about uh, half an hour or so, you're gonna go over with the torch to pop any bubbles. And you're gonna continue that process, the bubble popping process as they come up. Um, you don't need to sit there and watch it, but you know, you really need to pop those bubbles until it actually sets. The other cool thing about the silicone mold is silicone, as you know, is heat resistant. So, I mean, I can sit this here and do that to the mold without any issues. It's not gonna melt the mold. It's not gonna catch fire in like a wood mold or a uh, HTP mold, which can melt because it's a thermal, thermostat plastic. Two and a half days have passed and the epoxy is now set. Remember, this was a slow cure epoxy because of the thickness of this board. So it took a little bit longer than your typical 24 hour period for the initial cure. So roughly, like I said, two and a half days have passed and now the time to demold our project. And this is obviously where the silicone molds excel. So what I'm gonna do is just take our weights off, shift this over here so you can see the camera. And that was basically no effort. As you can see, it's super flexible, stays clean in there. And we have our board. Now, one thing I want to point out, which I'm actually kind of glad happened, is uh, a couple of days ago when I did pour this, um, I had to run out and run some errands and then I didn't get back to the shop. So I did the initial, um, you know, heat gun application to get rid of the bubbles after about an hour, but then I left it. And of course, once it's set a little bit more, you can see there's some bubbles in there. We'll get a close shot there. So these bubbles, um, you know, like I said, this is not a desirable effect, but we can actually get rid of those by planing. Those bubbles are, you know, a 16th, maybe at most an eighth inch below the surface, uh, starting below the surface. So once you plane that down, we can get rid of that and you won't even see them in the finished project. But anyway, that is the key advantage for these molds. And again, you can go to boardmolds.com to grab one of these. We've got them in 12, 24, 18 by nine, uh, the typical popular sizes. Um, but we're gonna continue to finish this board. Um, so we are next going to run it through our planer. Uh, then we'll router it, sand it, and oil it. Through the planer a few times on both sides to get it nice and level. We've probably taken off uh, anywhere between a quarter inch and three eighths from the entire, uh, so you speak inch and a half, um, a little less than inch and a half when we poured it. So uh, it's probably about an inch and an eighth now. And uh, yeah, so there you go. You can see that it's completely flat. The wood is completely flat and, and level with the epoxy. And that's the entire point of the planer. So now what we can do here is uh, trim it up 
You can see that we probably don't want that in the final piece, this section. Uh, we're also going to trim the edges. And once that's done, we can rotor it. Uh, if you, if you, rotoring it is optional. Uh, rotoring it would be to round the edges, to round the sides, which I personally like to do. I like the look of that. Some people like a nice flush 90 degree look. Um, but once it's routered, once it's trimmed, routered, we can sand, 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 um, and then oil, and then it'll be done. So our board is ready for sanding. Sanding is the least fun part of this job. Uh, as any woodworker knows, sanding is just not fun at all. Now, sanding I also find with, with resin and these security boards seems to be like there's a lot of different opinions. Um, some people will start at 80 and like work their way up to like 800 or 1000 or even, I've seen guys that'll do 2000 to make that board like, like glass. Um, that's fine if you wanna put that much effort into it. However, here's what I've found. A lot of the finishes, like say Ruby or Monaco, which you wouldn't necessarily use on a, a security board, but like Walrus Oil, for example, um, anything past 180 or 220 grit, uh, the oil doesn't absorb into the wood. Uh, it, it's so smooth and you don't have the open pores anymore that the oil doesn't absorb properly. So if you're gonna go sand a board to 800 or 1000, that's fine, it'll look awesome before you oil it and you can oil it, but you're not gonna get the deep penetration of that oil that finish. So because of that, uh, and also just because of time and, and energy, um, I usually start at 120 and then go to either 220 or 320. Um, so I'm gonna do this one to 220 so you can see. Um, and why do I start at 120? So what I found in the past, it might just be this resin and it might be the fact that I've got this type of um, regular orbital, um, orbital sander instead of something like a Festool sander. But when I use the 80 and start with that, I always end up with scratches and grooves, circular grooves, uh, marks in the, uh, in the epoxy. So I found when I started at 120, it's less porous. It takes time for that initial, longer for that initial sand, um, but I don't see the, the marks nearly as much, if, if at all. So I don't use 80 um, when I'm doing these boards. I'm gonna do, one uh, I'm gonna do 120, 180, and 220, and uh, we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. 
So after 20 minutes or half an hour of sanding, you're gonna end up with a board like this. Fairly smooth, still a little bit matte looking around the epoxy, um, but the oil finish that you're gonna add is gonna really make that pop. Um, the one thing I wanted to mention is, especially if you have bubbles in the epoxy, um, when you have little pinholes, as usually caused by a bubble, you sand it down and it's exposed a little bit of a divot. So there's a couple here, uh, it's obviously not gonna see it in the camera, but there's a couple small uh, pinholes here. And normally what you would do at this point after sanding, find those pinholes, is you'd mix a tiny little bit of epoxy, pour it in there, let it settle, and then come back and sand it again. Um, for the case of this video, the explanation is probably sufficient, but you could do that if you want to. Um, but just to get this video done and, and move on to the finishing uh, phase of oiling, um, I'm gonna skip filling those, those tiny little pinholes. Um, so you're gonna wanna take a tack cloth or just a very mildly damp uh, towel, uh, non, a lint-free towel, uh, and just wipe any sort of excess sawdust off here. Um, and once that's done, you can do the fun part which is applying the final finish so you can see what your board's gonna look like. And we use uh, walrus oil, um, not actually made from walruses, um, but it's a mix of coconut oil, vitamin E, uh, pure mineral oil, beeswax, a bunch of fun stuff. But it's a really popular product amongst woodworkers. Um, there's also other bo uh, board butters and other oils you can get from Amazon and, uh, and other wood supply stores. But for the sake of this video, we're gonna use walrus oil. And this is always a fun part, just throwing it on there. You don't need a lot. Um, I actually have a vat um, of walrus oil here in the shop that I just pour everything into and then I can just kind of reuse the oil. Uh, but for the sake of this video, I'm just showing you how you would normally do it at home or at, uh, at a small shop. Just applying the oil and then just working it into the board. Use a paintbrush for this, or you could use cloth, or if you want to just use your hands and put a rubber glove on, that works as well. The key is you, it doesn't have to be perfect because really what you're doing is you're just applying the oil and then it's going to let it sit and absorb there. Um, every oil is different. I think walrus oil, I don't have any instructions on there, but uh, I think it's like, you know, wipe the initial stuff off after an hour and then basically within. Uh, 24 hours it's kind of cured and dried and ready to use. You can see really how this the color of that um, ambrosia maple pops it's like a way way more yellow now and you can see the the texture uh, of those swirls we put into the epoxy. To the other side want to low on this stuff and you have to look some more. You can also maybe see here some of the couple of little pinholes that we could have we could have filled with more epoxy before doing this. Again, it depends on your level of perfection. If you're making these for people and they're paying a heck of a lot of money for them, then you'll probably want to make them as perfect as possible. If you're making it for yourself or your wife or your husband or whatever you want, uh, whatever you're doing, then you could probably get away with a couple of pinholes and not having to worry about that. All right, so normally what you would do is you would let it sit um, for like roughly an hour, maybe half an hour and let that uh, oil soak in there and then come back and rub it off. This brings us to the end of our video on how to make a resident wood charcuterie board like this. So we started with a raw live edge piece of ambrosia maple and we now have a finished product that we can either use or sell. And I think the big takeaway from this, obviously we're biased, but is to invest in a good mold. Uh, we sell uh, silicone board molds, which are uh, commercial grade, you know, production capacity molds, super thick. Uh, and this is a 24 by 12 that we use for this board, but we also have them in 18 by nine, and we've got some other sizes coming out as well. Um, you can also buy an HDP mold, or you can make your own HDP mold. Um, if you watch one of our other videos, uh, we went through how to make a wooden tuck tape mold. I really only recommend that if you're building, you know, a couple of these a year. If you're going to be doing this as a business or even like a high-end hobby where you're going to be selling them or making them for your friends and family, and you and you have a fixed size in mind, you know, like a common size, 24, 12, 18, 9, 20, 10, whatever it may be, um, invest in a mold because you're going to save so much time and it's going to pay for itself, you know, after four or five boards. Anyway, I hope you uh, enjoyed this video. Please hit subscribe on this YouTube channel if you're watching on YouTube. 
and happy making.